Hey everyone and welcome to our live. We are so happy that you joined us. Let us know where you are joining us uh, from. I know James is here in the house with me. Hey James, you want to say hi? Hey everybody, thanks so much for tuning in. Awesome. James is going to, I guess, uh, ask any questions that you guys might have while we are doing this. And I also have Beth Deer and Jesse Deer in the background. So they'll be monitoring uh, YouTube and Facebook. And this is going to be an embroidery medic, I guess, live. Uh, some of you may have seen that on our YouTube channel this week, I did release an embroidery medic, which goes into a pretty deep dive. I, I pretty much lost that patient completely, had to start from scratch. And I went into probably more theory than I normally do when trying to, I guess, recreate a design. And with this one, I'm going to also uh, take a design that was sent in to me uh, keep in mind, guys, I can't review every single design that's sent in, but I do get quite a few requests almost uh, weekly. We get a couple and I do look them over and see if they kind of qualify for something that I can share with you guys to, I guess, uh, give you some educational content and to give you uh, some theory on how and why to do things. So that is our goal for this one. Now, this one was completely different because it is not a patient that was lost. It was actually a design that was sent in where the person uh, asked if the design could run with less color changes. And, um, you know, it's, it's kind of funny, but in production, sometimes people see many color changes within a design and they think that's kind of a bad thing because of constantly changing the thread. And I will let you know that if you are running a home machine, which is more of a flatbed machine, then definitely changing those colors can consume a lot of your time because the machine has to stop. You have to take the thread off. You have to thread it through and then you have to start again. And if you have 17 or 18 color changes in a design, that gets a little bit repetitive and not in a good way. Uh, if you have a multi-needle machine, which is more of a commercial machine that is tubular. You got that arm coming straight out the front and you can get into you know, pockets and do baseball hats, all that good stuff. Then you aren't quite as concerned with color changes because the machine will kind of trim, stop, the head moves over from one color to the next and then start sewing again. And I'm gonna give you probably a little bit of a perspective on this design with regards to more commercial applications. Um, give it for you guys who don't know me that well. I've been in this industry forever and a day. I am third generation, kind of fourth because my great grandmother worked in the factory as well, but my grandparents started our business and from the fifties all the way through to the late nineties, we were contract embroiderers. And when I was involved in the business, I, uh, ran the multi head part of our, of our, I guess, company. It was a factory where we had 136 heads running. We had 18 head machines and 24 head machines. And besides our factory, we were also affiliated with a jacket manufacturer, a cap manufacturer, and a company that did licensing for sports. And between ourselves and our partner, they had about four times the amount of embroidery heads than we did. So we were digitizing or creating designs for not only our production, but for other people's uh, production as well. And I think the times have changed a little bit because when I learned this and when I ran my production, it was for machines that were, you know, larger multi heads. They actually had 24 heads on our flatbeds and 18 on our tubular. And when you're running a, a machine with that many heads, all doing designs at the same time, it's a little different than what I see today where people have a single head, a two head, a four head, maybe they have a six head machine. And I know there's some, 12 head machines, but the days of those large multi heads are gone. And that's where things kind of change because I remember in the old days, we would have our factory running a shifts and we ran three shifts. It ran 24 hours a day, usually five to six days a week. We didn't run on Sunday, but every one of my shifts would come in and they'd work on a 24 head machine. Now, when you look at 24 garments all running at the same time, odds that the tensions on every one of those heads being perfect is pretty slim. You're going to have issues. Uh, you're going to have one head running a little tighter than others, some threads. And then we also had the, I guess, added benefit of having a day shift, an afternoon shift, and a night shift. 
And the, I guess, experience of each of those watchers, we call them watchers, would differ from each shift. And you could have a machine that was running perfectly on the same design all day long for seven hours, and then it gets to the night shift, and the person there starts fiddling with the tension knobs and doing stuff that they probably shouldn't be, and all of a sudden your production is way off, your quality goes down, and it's specifically because of those factors. So I, when I digitized for our company and for other companies for many, many years, I kind of called myself a paranoid puncher. Uh, if you don't know what that means, puncher, that's what we called ourselves back in the day. We weren't known as digitizers. We were called punchers. And I was a paranoid puncher because I had to make sure that my designs ran well on not a single head, but a 18 or 24 or 30 head machine. And I had to make sure that my production ran well on the day shift as well as it did the afternoon and the night shift. So I probably get a little more finicky and precise about designs. And that's sort of where I'm going to go with this. And I'm going to show you a design. And this one's kind of cool because this was sent to me. The design came in and it was actually very well digitized in my opinion. And again, the person said their, I guess, question was, can we reduce the amount of colors in this design? And I'm going to bring it up on screen here. So just let me get ready for a second, guys. Uh, let's get this up here. Do we have any questions, James? Are people... Uh, Commenting no. at all about anything? Not well, a ton yet, but we've got people joining in from all over the place. So awesome. thanks for tuning in, everybody. Awesome. Well, welcome, everybody. We appreciate your joining us. Okay. Now, here is the software. I'm going to make myself really small so that you can see the screen. And I'm going to bring in this design. And I'm sorry, but i got to put up my goggles because the eyesight is starting to fail me after this many years of looking at a computer screen. I'm sure some of you can relate. But I'm going to open from my, uh, my recent designs, and I'm going to bring this one in here, and it's a 2023 uh, Detroit Lakes design. Now, when this design first came in, I do want you to know that it did say right on the screen that this was not, an, uh, I guess, a grade A or B EMB file. It is an EMB file, which for those of you who aren't familiar with Wilcom, or hatch, that is the native file format of that program, which means that you're going to have object-based pieces, but it didn't come up saying that it was grade A or B. And sometimes that confuses people because they're like, okay, if it's a C or D file, what does that mean? And what it means is it might have been uh, created in a very old version of the software. And I can tell that this was a very old version, even though this... Uh, design was digitized very recently. It's actually for 2023. I can see that the EMB version type is version 5.0. So this is going well back before uh, the most recent versions. And I'm not going to say this is a fact or isn't a fact, but I know that a lot of commercial digitizers out there unfortunately use cracked software programs. They're not legally purchased. And when I see a file that's this old, and it's made, I guess, this recently, I kind of put two and two together and think, well, this might have been created by somebody who isn't using a recent or legal uh, program, but that's not for me to judge. Uh, but when I do look at this, I can tell also because when I go into all of the different objects, not the colors, I can see that the objects break down far more than they should. And I'm talking within certain fills, like there it is separated the underlay fill from the top fills. And that normally wouldn't happen with a grade A or B file that is newer and object-based. Now, I went off, I guess, on a little bit of a side note there, but I just wanted to, you guys to know why things can be considered uh, ver, you know, grade A or B. And obviously, the better the grade, the easier it is to edit the design. And that's where this one would be a little bit more difficult to edit because it's broken it into a ton of objects. This actually has 430 objects within the design. To give you a little overview, it's 35,303 stitches, and this is important information. Uh, it's three colors, 16 stops, or 15 color changes. Now, when it says stops, obviously the first color is, uh, you know, that you're going to start the machine with is a actual color, but then it's going to change 15 more times as it goes through all of the different pieces, and that's what this person didn't want. They didn't want it to you know, change so many times, and they asked, is it necessary? Now, here, there is also 40 trims in the design. 
Now, when I look at production, I look at a design and I say to myself, even though this design has 35,303 stitches, that's not reality in production, especially when you're dealing with making money with embroidery, you have a multi-head machine, you have you know, uh, many needles running. I have to look at the stops and the trims as well. And something that I, I sort of generated as a little guideline many, many years ago when I was calculating production and profitability, because it's a penny business, you have to, you know, every stitch is money that is on that machine. And I did do an estimate that every trim usually calculates to approximately 150 stitches of runtime. Now, what I mean by that is when a machine has to stop, it slows down, it stops, it trims, and then it moves over and then it starts up again, usually at slow speed so that it ties in the bobbin again and then it ramps up and it keeps going. Every single trim that you have in a design is actually about 150 stitches of downtime. And if you have one of those stops or color changes, that is actually even a little bit more. It's a lot more if you are on a uh, you know, home machine because you're literally having to take all the threads and take them off, put them on. It's a lot of downtime. But even on a multi-needle machine, that machine not only has to slow down, trim, you know, move, uh, start up slow and go again, but it has to stop. The head has to move over and then it keeps going. So I added in, believe it or not, an extra 25 stitches of lost production time. So if I'm looking at this design exactly the way it stands, I'm looking at uh, in ch changes alone, color changes, meaning 15 changes, at 175 stitches per change, I have 2,625 stitches of lost production time. Then I have 40 trims at 150 stitches, which is 6,000 stitches of lost production time. So that is 8,625 stitches, which I need to add on to that 35,303. So even though you see a design and it comes onto your production floor and you see the stitch count and you say to yourself, oh, this is the stitch count, this is how much I need to charge. Most embroiderers don't take into account all of the lost time. And that's why designs that are digitized well are so important for profit and productivity. So this design is actually a 43,928 stitch design. I just want to put that into uh, you know, perspective if you are to take this design and run it in a production setting. Now, one thing that I will say about this design is I actually take my hat off to the digitizer. They did a great job as far as my old school behavior, which was being a paranoid puncher. Because if I turn the true view on and I go to my player here, and I'm going to go through this kind of by all of the colors that are happening, they actually did this. So this white area on both of these uh, bats is going down one and two. They're outlining each bat with the two colors. So that is a ton of color, uh, you know, uh, I guess changes just in these bats. But I guarantee you that no matter what you run this on, whether you float it, whether you hoop it, whether you run it on PK knit or denim or toilet paper, you're probably going to have good registration because of all of the extra effort and color changes. And that might seem kind of unnecessary. But again, if you are running multi-heads or if you're dealing with somebody who doesn't know how to hoop properly, you're always going to get really, really good results. So this is the way I probably would have digitized a design for production. And when I did run a sample, because I did run a sample, it came out perfect. There are a couple things that I would change in this design if I were digitizing it. And uh, I'll show you two of the things as soon as it finishes here, but it's gonna do these outlines, it's gonna do the fill, then it's going to outline it and this design is done. The things that I would have changed are these. I would have come into the bats and let's see here if I can get in. I would have come into this bat here and instead of a tatami or fill stitch, I would have changed this to a satin. That would have reduced the stitch count a little bit on each side of the bat. I also would have gone to the top of the bat here and I probably would have had this satin go all the way around to define the shape of the bat and had a fill stitch in there as well. That way I know it's going to look, I guess, a, a little bit cleaner when it actually stitches out because I don't like when you abruptly change from a satin to a fill. It's kind of like, you know, you go from a smooth road to a bumpy road and you can kind of feel the difference. Well, in this one, you kind of see it a little bit. It's not bad, but it's just something that I personally would change a little bit. 
Other than that, the design is actually done really well. All of the underlapping and overlapping in that two color font, the amount of space that they gave for pull compensation and push compensation, it's all done really, really well. The only thing that I would change, and this is something that I try to tell people, I have some YouTube videos about it, is carving holes in small objects. If you look at this, the person who digitized this actually carved a little hole for the state of Detroit. And what, or not, sorry, not the state, but anyways, uh, Michigan. I know that Detroit is the city, Michigan. Hey, anyways, I'm sure I would have got some comments on that one, but I caught myself, James. Um, but here's what I would do. And this is kind of where, if I look at this, and this is where I'm going to see that this file is not exactly a EMB grade A file. Instead of having one fill, it actually, when I highlight this, it is separated into two different pieces. If I hit the H key, I'm going to come in here, grab all of those pieces, and let's look at the stitch count right now. It is actually, as I said, it's 35,303 stitches. Now, a lot of people think by carving out little holes in small areas of fills, you're doing a favor to the design because you're reducing the stitch count. But what they don't remember is you're actually adding more penetrations to outline that shape. So if I delete those, and there they are, I got rid of them. There's no longer a hole in that fill. Now it actually is uh, 35,287. The stitch count actually went down by removing that. And when I do look at the sample, and I'm going to get rid of this screen for one second right here. So let's hide this one. I'm going to bring this one up. I just have to find my sample, guys. I got a ton of samples here that I need to show you. And this is where these were so close. I have two samples here of the designs, one that I'm going to edit, and I'll show you what I did to edit it. But they are so close in visual effect after I did this, it's really hard for me to tell the difference between the two. And I can see it by looking super close. And let me just move the camera on so you guys get a picture here. And let's go right over to here. And there we go. So there's my cheat sheet. Okay, so if you look at this, there is the design. That is the one with 16 color changes in there. Everything lines up pretty much perfectly. There's no gapping anywhere except for right here around that little area. Can you see the little bit of blue popping through right here? That is because they carved a hole. So carving holes, in my opinion, in small areas are dangerous on many levels because in my opinion, this design would have been close to perfect had they not carved that one hole. But let's just leave it as it is. I did not redigitize this design. The only thing I did to remove the amount of colors in this design was I took it into the Hatch software, which is a Wilcom platform. Let me just bring this back onto screen. So there we are, we have the design back up. And this is the beauty of Hatch and having an EMB format. And keep in mind, this is one big thing that I, and, and this is one of the main reasons why I obviously am a big supporter of Hatch. We are an official reseller is I have used the Wilcom platform for over three decades. I know it really, really well. And I also know that about 90% of the commercial digitizers out there who produce files do use Wilcom. So they are providing EMB files if you ask for it, which means that if you have Hatch, you can bring in this design right here. And I'm gonna just bring it right over here. I can, oops, let's go out of there. I don't wanna do that. But I can bring in this design here. I can highlight the entire design. So what I've done is I've grabbed all of these objects. And because it's EMB, I can come in here to customize design and tell it at the click of a button to optimize the color changes. And when I click that, it's gonna to say to me, it's going to take that 15 different color changes and it's going to reduce it down to six. Okay. That is a pretty big win if you know embroidery. So give me some thumbs up and stuff if you think that's pretty cool because you can take this and I'm going to click it. And now it's gone from those 16 colors and I now have six colors within the design. And if I go and do that redraw right now, and let's turn the true view back on, do the redraw you're going to see that it's now doing all of those bats. It's doing all of the fill. And I took out that little area in there. Then it's doing the outlines here, which is going underneath. So it even logically starts to resequence this. So it's layering it properly because it's an EMB file. And then it's giving me a desired outcome with a lot less color changes. Okay. So now we're looking at a design 
that has reduced the amount of color changes in this design. And if I do go back and let's close this for a second and I have the sample here, this is sample number two. Let's just close this screen real quick. And let's bring this one back over to here. Okay, so this is sample number two right here. And if you look at it close, it is actually almost identical. There, there is very, very little difference between having 16 color changes and having the six color changes. And the only way I can tell is right here on this one little white area where the red is, if you look really, really close, you can see a tiny little bit of separation on that design. And that is it. We are talking about a whole bunch of stuff that is you know, out of there as far as color changes. It reorganized the file, it reduced that. And now here's where you have to start looking at the numbers because you know, number one, I, I always say the proof is in the stitching, which it is, okay? Your, your design has to look good. That's number one is the design has to look good. But then you have to look at the numbers in production to see where you're going to save or not save in production. Now, if this design were being embroidered by somebody on a home machine, and I could take that 16 down to six, in my opinion, with very little difference in quality, that is a real win for the person who has to change those threads manually, okay, hands down. But if you were talking about a multi-needle machine, here's the difference. Before it went from 16, which is really 15 changes, to six changes. And that means that before there was 2,625 stitches of lost production time, and now there is only uh, 1,050 stitches. So we have reduced the amount of time because we reduced the color changes. But here's the flip side of the coin, because now the actual trims of the design has changed. It used to be 40 trims, and now it is actually 51. So I have to then work in reverse and say, okay, 150 stitches times by 51 is 7,650. So my total lost production on this file is 8,700 stitches, okay? So it actually is a little bit more before, just so you know, it was actually 8,625. So the one with more color changes in production would actually run 75 stitches quicker than the one where I use the optimization. Now this is where you guys are going to vote, okay? Because I, I don't know if you've ever you know, dug this deep or digging this deep, I don't know what the proper wording is, but I don't know if you've ever thought this deeply into one design, but you're gonna have to make a decision here. Would you rather have a design with 16 colors that has uh, you know, four th or sorry, 43,928 stitches, or would you rather have a design with six colors that has 44,066 stitches? There is a very, very minimal increase on the stitch count by reducing the amount of colors. Now, here's what you have to think about. Number one, if you have a home machine, your decision is simple. You're going to choose the one with less color changes, and you're only running one you know, design in one hoop. Your tensions are going to be good because you guys are all fantastic embroiders, and your tensions are always perfect. And you only you hoop your stuff nice and smoothly, so nothing's going to go wrong. So you're going to have no issues whatsoever, right? Knock on wood. Uh, but if you have a multi-needle machine, and if it's more than one head, if you have a multi-head machine that is running six pieces of embroidery at a time, or 12, or if you have more than one shift, you have employees coming in and they are actually running stuff and fiddling with the tensions and everything else, then you are taking a design. The first one that had more color changes is actually the safer bet. Do you, do you kind of get what I mean? It's a real balancing act of what you have to think about from your position as an embroiderer in, you know, in I guess, reflection to what your needs and your desires are. There's very little difference in stitch count. So to answer the person who sent that file in, there's virtually very little difference whether you optimize it or not. It depends on if you have a single head machine or a multi-head machine, uh, or whether you have a single needle machine or a multi-needle machine. Those will be your base factors on deciding what you're going to do with 
that design, whether you want to optimize it or you don't want to optimize it. So I, what have, pe have people been commenting at all, James, what they're feeling? Yeah, a lot of people are saying they'd rather have the six. The six? Yep, that's, that's cool. I mean, that's cool. And I, uh, as a paranoid puncher, I would probably, uh, if I were running a commercial machine with multiple heads and needles, I would probably choose the one with more color changes because I know the registration will be correct. We've done some pretty crazy designs lately uh, with regards to like our Easter designs, our Valentine's designs, our Christmas designs. They are super detailed, outlined with running stitches. And for the most part, they register really, really well. And it's because I put extra color changes in so I know there's not going to be any misregistration. So sometimes as a digitizer, having extra color changes is actually like a safety shield uh, for the embroiderer. Yes, James. Cool. Yeah, and a few people are saying they would uh, change colors more. We do have a few questions. Sure, let's, uh, let's hit the questions. Awesome, Doug from YouTube is asking, how do you know, or sorry, how do you now optimize or reduce the trims? Uh, that if I wanted to optimize or reduce the trims, I would have to take a deeper dive into the actual design and see if there were areas that I could actually travel between objects. Uh, as a digitizer, uh, you know, it, it would take me time. And sometimes as a digitizer, uh, let's put it this way. When I used to do commercial embroider and we had a, a design that we're doing for John Deere or, you know, Copper Tone or GM or for sports teams, I would sometimes spend a huge amount of time making sure that design was absolutely perfect because I knew there was going to be runs of thousands, tens of thousands, and sometimes hundreds of thousands of pieces. And every extra stitch that I could save would be money in our family's pocket, you know, and it wouldn't be falling off the embroidery table, so to speak. But if you're just digitizing stuff and you are looking at weighing your time versus your return, it really depends if you want to invest that much time into editing somebody else's design. So it can be done, but it requires more editing. Another question, James? Yeah, so the other question is from Juan on YouTube as well. He says, how do you make the settings on the screen look so good when removing the true view? I have hatched theory on my computer and I can hardly define things on my screen on a 27 inch display. Uh, I am guessing that might be a hardware uh, situation, meaning graphic cards. Uh, the, the, and I, I don't know, to be honest. I, I know enough that when I usually order a new computer for digitizing, I basically say to the guy, I want the fastest gaming computer money can buy and uh, make sure it has lots of, you know, uh, the, the stuff that, uh, James, you probably know way more about graphics cards and stuff like that. But if you're not seeing things visually clearly on the screen, I'd say that was more of a, a hardware issue than anything else. Yeah, and Juan, that might be a great question for our Hatchbacks Facebook group as well. Awesome. Yeah, because there's people out there who have a lot more experience. I'm a pretty good digitizer, but I have uh, no very little but anything else. Right, James? Yeah. <laughs> any other questions? That's it for now. Okay, awesome. So if you have any other questions, pop it in. But uh, I know that was a, uh, a, a quick little overview of a design. And again, I, I take my hat off to this digitizer. I think they did a great job. They're qualified even though there was a lot of color changes there but it sewed out great there was absolutely no nothing in production that i would flag uh, other than that carving the little hole now i do have a couple other things to cover guys if you guys want to uh, if you have any other questions send them into james but i do want to let you know we do have some fun stuff coming up i just got to change my screen here and there we go okay so we have a free design for you guys. Uh, if you guys uh, didn't know, the uh, coronation of uh, King Charles is happening in May. I believe it is May 6th, and it does say that on this. This is a free design that we are extending to everybody, actually two free designs for all of our friends in the Commonwealth and the UK. Uh, we just want to congratulate you guys. And um, I don't know if all of you know this, but I am Canadian and we are part of the Commonwealth. And uh, growing up as a, a child uh, in elementary school in the early 70s, I do specifically remember that I guess our, uh, our respect to the crown was significant. I, it was a big part of my childhood and having the queen on our wall and, and you know, just the, the way we felt about uh, being part of the Commonwealth. So 
this is something we felt led to do. These are the official logos that we're giving you, and you can go on to their website and see any copyright guidelines. We are not selling this file. Uh, we know that if you do read them, you are able to use these for personal use. You're able to use them for charity. You're, uh, there are some commercial applications, so I do not want to uh, make any uh, statements of what is and is not permissible, but I want you guys to know that they are free, and if you want to embroider them or you want to use them for any charitable organization, we want to extend that to you. And they are kind of fun. I did them in two different sizes, just so you know. And actually, I will call this up and hatch real quick because I did have them here as well. Let's bring that up, and let's go back to hatch for a second. So this was the first one that I did. Actually, that's the second one, sorry. That's that one, here's this one right here. Uh, that is the official artwork that I downloaded. And I did try to make sure when I digitize this for an actual uh, left chest, and it is a larger left chest design. If you can see right here, it will be a little bit larger. You can put it on a tote or whatever you want. I made sure that I followed the artwork as closely as possible. I didn't take very much, uh, you know, artistic, uh, you know, I guess, license on this. I wanted to make sure it was clear. Yes, James. I just wanted to point out the links to the three designs have been posted in the comments. Okay, so. awesome. They are up. Okay. Yeah. And it will be in our newsletter. So if anybody uh, misses this, obviously you'll get notified, but you won't know you missed it anyways. But anyways, this design will be there. And it is a uh, two color. There is actually three color changes here, just so you know, because of the registration stuff. Uh, meaning from inside out and all that good stuff. But this design does have trims between the letters and everything because we want it to be as close to the artwork as possible. But what I also wanted to do is I wanted to give you guys something that was a little bit, I guess, larger. Because if you are you know, standing in a crowd and you want to have this on the front of a sweatshirt, this will look okay. But we wanted something a little bit bigger with a little more splash. And I do want you to uh, remember the stitch counts here because this design has 24,273 stitches because it is a solid satin stitch. And the one that I did, which is the larger version, this is it here. And I did use different stitch types. So if you look at these stitch types that we used here, I did actually use the back stitches and I used the stem stitches for the uh, outer border. And this is done as an applique. So this is a large design that you can have on the front of a sweatshirt and the stitch count is 26,520. So if you look at this one at 20, you know, 26,000 or 26 and a half thousand stitches, and you look at the other one, which has 24,000 stitches, I think that it's kind of cool because you will be able to take this design and put it on the front of some really, really fun items. And um, I, I did do a plan A. Originally, I did want to do this design as a big Trapunto design on the front of a sweatshirt. And I did actually run a sample. And here is the sample that I ran. And I am not releasing this one because it is not perfect. Uh, there is some little registrations issues because of all the small holes that I had to uh, put in there. And the stitch count did increase. So I went back to the drawing board or the digitizing board, so to speak. And this is the size. So it's actually really cool because you can put it on the front of a sweatshirt. But this is the size of the design. And it, because it is an applique with the stem stitches, I think it has a really, really awesome, cool feel to that. And I hope you guys have fun with that. And uh, anyways, yeah, it's uh, for all of you in the Commonwealth. It's I know you'll be watching. Any questions, James? Yeah. Pam from Facebook is asking, do you digitize differently for different fabric types? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, I do digitize differently. And I know that uh, Wilcom does have something called Fabric Assist, which you can choose the type of fabric that you want to embroider on. And it will, with not necessarily limitations, but to the best of the property settings for standard fabrics, it will adjust the density, pull compensations, and underlay based on the fabric you choose. It is a fantastic tool because after you did something, digitize something in the native format, and if you want to change from cotton to tie silk or to leather or to PK knit, you can hit the button and it will adjust it automatically. Um, here's the thing, though. 
I don't use those features very often because again, Paranoid Puncher, I digitized not only for our factories for over a decade, but I had a, uh, I had a company uh, that I started called Punch Perfect. And we had hundreds of active uh, companies all over the world at one point in the 80s and 90s where we digitized designs. And they were all large, larger volume manufacturers. And I came up with my own recipes for doing things that I found worked well in most applications because I know that very rarely do people run a design on the same thing every single time. You're going to you know, run it on denim one day and toilet paper the next. I mean, it could be on anything. And yes, you need to make, I guess, uh, you know, little changes if it is an extreme, but I do have some recipes that I use that I have set as custom templates that I use for most of my digitizing. And that comes with experience. Uh, digitizing is a lifelong learning experience. Any other questions? Cool. Yep, Monique is asking, on your more dense John Deere designs, maybe the signature series ones, the ones with many layers, how do I know how much extra stabilizer to use rather than the standard? Is there a formula? Uh, I, I usually, when we run our samples for our signature series designs, which are more artistic merit designs, they aren't necessarily digitized to be production friendly in, in mass volume settings. Uh, and they do layer colors and I blend stitches together to try to create those watercolor or artistic merit effects. Uh, I try my best to keep them so they don't become bulletproof, meaning your machine's going to start hammering like a drum, uh, but they will in some areas to get the detail have more stitches. Uh, we generally run all of our samples using one layer of a no-show mesh stabilizer, which is kind of a stabilizer that has a fused uh, interfacing on it. So it actually goes uh, horizontally and diagonally and gives you uh, good stability in either direction. So beyond using that, uh, if you need to, on some materials, use a heavier weight cutaway, uh, then you know definitely you may need to do that. It, it just depends on the application that it's going to go on. Uh, one other thing that I will say is for any of those design, I you know can almost I beg you, please hoop your item securely within a hoop and hoop it properly because floating designs that are meant to have registration and have a lot of detail in them, uh, when you float a design, you're really not offering any stability to the fabric and the hoop at the same time, and you can get lots of puckering and things that happen in that situation. T-Town is asking, can you ever get away with a tearaway on a polyester polo? I have a job I'm doing now that is a small logo on the sleeve and it would be nice to have a tearaway on there. Uh, personally, I've, I've never used tearaways on, on, in that application. I find it's too risky. I would usually always use a cutaway. But again, it depends on which expert in the industry you talk to. I know that you know we have friends in the industry who have certain recipes that they love and use. Uh, some of them will use tearaways with a little bit of spray adhesive so that it gives an extra bit of stability while it is actually embroidering and then they tear it off. I think it's all about experimentation at that point. We, when we ran production, we were, uh, keep in mind it was decades ago, we didn't have all the options of the products that you have now. There were sort of cutaway, tearaway and different weights and we had water soluble toppings or Solvi at that point. And that's what we basically worked with to get our, our jobs done. Other questions? That's it for right now. Okay, awesome, awesome. So I'll go back to the slides, guys. We are done. This will not be a really, really long live, but I hope you guys enjoy that free design. Did we get any comments, people liking that one? Yeah, absolutely. A lot of people are very happy. Joe was impressed that you uh, were able to do it so fast. She actually posted her uh, attempt at it yesterday in the Facebook group. So. Oh, okay. Well, actually, I, it wasn't fast. I digitized this design how many weeks ago, James? I'm not even sure. Okay. I, I digitized it maybe three or four weeks ago, and we've kind of been putting it in the you know uh, list of things, and it was just happened to be uh, released for this live. But I also did uh, just just so you guys know, because I was not happy with this Trapunto design, and I made a decision at what time did we get back today, James? <laughs> couple hours ago. Yeah, we got back about two and a half, three hours ago. James and I had a, an appointment we had to go to. 
And I decided that I did not want to release this Trapunto because I, I did not like the registration. So I went in, edited the file and ran the sample. And when did the sample finish? Uh, about three minutes before the stream started. Three minutes before the stream started, we actually got this one done. And Beth got it online while you guys uh, were watching before we did it. So we have an awesome team here. You guys are, <laughs> the deer kids are doing great. We appreciate that. Awesome. Another question. Yep. Uh, do you digitize holes under layers? Uh, do I digitize holes under layers? I try to avoid digitizing small holes in most designs. If I can, if I can have a fill run straight through something and uh, then run a, a little bit lower density as I build objects up, I'd much rather do that than, you know, dig a hole because stitches can fall into the hole, number one, and stitches can also change the appearance of the stitches on top. You know, like if you have a black shirt with a white fill and you carve a hole in it and then you have a light yellow going over top of that you know, black fabric that's you've carved a hole in, it can actually give you uh, a, a not as nice as a visual effect as you putting stitches on top of stitches. It really depends, but I try personally to avoid making holes in small areas. If I can save stitches in a longer area, then two thumbs up, I'll dig holes or, you know, do whatever I want, but small areas, I try to avoid it. Willow is asking, any tips for digitizing designs on fabric with the nap? Fabric with a nap. With a nap. Uh, actually, I would suggest using a hatch smash or a knockdown. I, you know, there's different terms. The, the term knockdown stitches, we've been using that term in embroidery uh, for decades. And we would, uh, 35 years ago, when we actually did uh, work on uh, terry cloth, or we did work on ser serpa fleece, or we did work on even a very loose milled golf shirt where we were putting small lettering. And if you know a golf shirt, it's sewn on the bias and it usually stretches this way more than it does this way. And sometimes you could lose the letter I into the hills and the valleys of that knit. So we would uh, sometimes put down a knockdown or a, uh, a, uh, you know, a, a base fill, which is going to be there you know, to give it stability of the fabric. And we'd always try to match the color of that fill to the color of the shirt. So visually, when you're looking at it uh, from a safe distance, we as embroiderers, we want to get right up close to somebody's embroidery and get a really close look at those stitches. But that's not how the real world works, because I found that when I look at somebody's left chest design and I get up that close, I might get slapped because I'm, I'm getting it in people's, you know, uh, space. So what I want to do is I want to look at embroidery at a little bit of a distance, you know, like you would normally. And if I can't see those base stitches uh, visually because the colors are so close, then it's going to just increase the stitches, the quality of the stitches that you do see. Now, the other thing I would do is make sure if you're not doing that, use water soluble toppings. You know, Solvi is a, you know, uh, a product that's a, uh, I guess, a trademarked product. It's a water soluble topping, but there's other ones as well. And that will help you to keep stitches from sinking into naps or terry cloth or anything like that. Awesome. We do have a few more questions, but we'll dive right back into them after we uh, share some, a couple more announcements. Okay, sure. Guys. Yep, I will show a couple more things here real quick, guys. Oh, uh, number one, I just want you guys to know that Hatch does have a sale going on right now for their beginning module. They, they, Hatch does actually have four different levels. Their initial level is called organizer. And if there is any of you out there who has an embroidery design stash, which I know a lot of you do, you know, tens or hundreds or thousands of embroidery files, finding them and organizing them is uh, sometimes a little bit of a tricky feat. And the organizer program, which is on sale right now for only $99, it's 33% off. I think it's normally $150, right, James? Yep. Uh, this actually does give you within your software the ability to organize your files, but it also gives you the ability to choose colors for your designs. You can custom build your, your you know, thread color chest, so to speak. 
it gives you the ability to resize designs and especially within EMB file formats. It also gives you the ability with the Fabric Assist to take those EMB files and choose different fabric types like we were just talking about. If you uh, purchase our designs, and I think we're one of the few companies out there that does provide EMB files with the majority of our designs that you get from us, you will always be able to resize a native file in the native software better than anything else or any other software will. In other words, if you're getting a design that was digitized in Wilcom, which is what we use, which is a Hatch product, and you take our design and put it into the organizer, you can change the fabric type at a click of a button. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. So for those of you who aren't into lettering or editing or digitizing, but you want to have a way to do some of the foundational stuff with the designs, this is an incredible offer to get involved. And then if you ever want to do layout and lettering and all that other good stuff, you can always upgrade to the next level and you just pay the difference in the advertised price at that time. And so, if you are a Legacy Design Club member, the organizer really is a cherry on top. Oh, yeah, it is. It's it's an incredible, uh, you know, asset to your embroidery stash and your embroidery life. You know, I mean, it just makes things so much easier. And if you do move up into the lettering, uh, how many fonts do we have, James, that are ESA fonts? I have over 950 at this point. My goal is to reach 1,000. So I have digitized over 950 fonts that you can use within the uh, Hatch platform. So that is another added bonus. So that sale is going on right now and it's for a few more days, I think. Just, uh, I don't know how many days, but a few more days. So you'll wanna get on there and get some information on that. Uh, if you joined us a couple weeks ago, we showed you all of our new Easter designs. We had some in the hoop projects, some great stuff. It still is on special, it's 82% off right now. And I believe it's for three more days. So there's three more days and you can get that bundle. There is a ton of designs. I know the, the value independently is like almost, I think $250 or something like that for the designs individually. So it is a great deal. And other than that, we just want to wish everybody a very, very happy Easter. It is a fun time. Hopefully we can all afford eggs this year. Um, James, uh, anything you want to add to that? Is Easter Bunny going to be good to you? Your mom <laughs> sure and I have to so. hide, hide some eggs for you? Hey, let's hope we can find them all this year. <laughs> Anybody else ever done that where you find eggs and other things like, uh, you know, three or four or one year later and that's where they are? So anyways, um, I just wanted to wish you guys that. Uh, a couple more questions, James, I, we can answer. Uh, before that, I guess I'll just say, please join us on social media. We have three different groups, uh, all geared to specific needs. Hatch is one, our design doodle or another, our generic embroidery digitizing, and our YouTube channel, which we actually did hit over 60,000, which mm -hmm. we were asking, yay, so that's awesome. So all of that's there. And then our free resources, we have a ton of stuff for all of you getting started. If you want free education, cheat sheets, a video resource, just follow the links that the kids put up and you will get uh, all kinds of information to make your embroidery life easier. And Hatch does have a free demo version, all that good stuff there. And we do have a free Hatch challenge. So if you download the program, we're not going to leave you there with a program that you have to learn all by yourself. We'll give you some education to get you started. Awesome. Cool. And that was a mouthful. Okay, Mr. Deer, a couple more closing questions. Yeah. Siri is asking, when digitizing, what format is best to ask the customer to send their artwork? Uh, I, I usually try to ask for e either a vector file. Again, that is specifically if you do have Corel Draw or Illustrator, because if you don't have those programs, probably a vector file, which is outline files, will not do you any good either. Or a high resolution uh, raster file like a PNG. I usually like working from PNGs or JPEGs or something like that, as long as it is a half decent resolution. If you've ever taken any of my education, you know I digitize at a set scale. Anybody want to type in that scale right now? See if anybody types it in. But I digitize at a set scale. I've done that for decades and decades. And as long as when I zoom into that scale, my artwork looks clean and nice and smooth, then I don't get a jagged staircase and I can digitize from anything. Uh, a lot of people ask if using vector art is better than raster. 
Uh, it can be sometimes, but it can work against you as well because you have to recreate a design for embroidery, not for print. And there are big differences between how things are layered for both those applications. Awesome. We got lots of guesses, lots of 600, six awesome. to one. Yep, six three to one, three. six to one. Awesome, awesome. Cool. Okay. Um, does digitizer include the organizer for Hatch? Yes, it does. If you have the digitizer module for Hatch, you got it all. That's the that's the uh, the top level, which includes everything underneath. So you do not need to you know get the organizer uh, module because you have it already. Cool. Well, Linda is asking. I have a log that I need to digitize. Can I? Um, that would be a great thing to post in our Facebook group to get some some, tips. some feedback. Yeah, if you're talking about a log or a wood effect, uh, really the number one question I would ask is what size is the log going to be? Because the amount of detail I get into some designs will depend on the size that I have to work with. I'll choose stitch types. I'll choose blending. I'll choose densities. And some th sometimes, I remember the old days, I, I should try to dig this out if I can, but I did a really, really cool... Uh, design that was a logs. It was for actually a true north log homes. And I actually did it as an applique and I used brown material. And then I used very, very loose fills to get those wood grain effects. And it looks spectacular. I actually won a prize, a commercial industry prize for that design because it had a low stitch count and it looked great because I utilized multimedia. I used, used an applique in there. Awesome. Uh, not a ton of questions left. Marianne said that she missed us at the Puyallup So Expo. Yeah, my kids aren't letting me out of the... Uh, apparently, I've been pretty productive the last couple of years uh, in lockdown. And we do have uh, hopes and plans to get out there again in the future. So if you do want to see uh, when we do start hitting the road again where we're going to be, uh, please join our newsletter because it's the best way to find out what's happening, right? Absolutely. Okay, awesome. Okay, guys. Well, I want to thank you guys very much for joining us. Uh, I, I thought this one went okay, James, considering we got the whole thing done in like a couple hours. So it was yeah. it was tight. It wasn't I had the to... same without Mama Deer, but we got through it. Yeah, actually. And Jennifer, hi. She might be watching. Ma Mama Deer is with the baby deer. She's visiting the grandkids, and I miss her with all my heart. But they they need her love too. So we love you, Mom. Anything else? That's about it. Thank you so much okay. for tuning in, everybody. Thank you, and happy Easter, guys. And if you do end up sewing that sample, be sure to uh, share some stitch outs. Yeah, yeah, we have a stitch to win thing that Beth does every single month. So just post that in our groups, and you can win some great prizes. Okay, take care. Happy Easter, guys.